away we go, because you know the recording doesn't work unless you press record. I have made that mistake too many times. So welcome everybody to Generalized Linear Models. This is my second time teaching this course, but it's the first time with the new number that was formally granted to me last year. So 6270 as a brand new course. Uh, for those of you who do not know me yet, uh, welcome, and you can call me Lisa. I am officially Dr. Lisa Hoffman, but the only person who calls me that is my dad when he wants to be ironic. So Lisa is just fine. Um, in, in terms of spelling and pronunciation, it's just regular Lisa. There's no Lisa, there's no Z, there's no Lessa, just regular old Lisa. Uh, the story behind the spelling of my name is typically L-I-S-A minus L-E-S-A, is that my mom said when I was born that I looked like a Lisa, but not the regular kind. That's the official story that I was told. I think there may have been drugs involved, because my mom is not normally that type of create, creative person. So just call me Lisa. It's fine. Uh, in terms of where to find stuff, this is a good time for us to start the screen share. We're going to start with a web page. Here we go. Let me move this thingy out of the way. Wait, how do I? Participants can now see my screen. Well, that's good, because I want this thingy to go away. Maybe it'll eventually go away. I can't remember how to do it. This is our course web page. And for those of you who have been around as long as I have, and you're looking at this and you're thinking, yeah, 1997 called, and it wants its web design back, you are not wrong. But the advantage of a simplistic structure like this is that everything is on one page. So this is where you go to find your lecture materials, such as Lecture Zero that we're going to be going over today. Um, this is the table of events. The readings that are in this last column here are going to be in icon instead under files because I don't want to violate copyright law. After the table, you'll see all of the other verbiage that is in the syllabus, as well as links to various places, such as links to uh, all of the other services that we'll do in terms of using software, uh, the references for, the re for everything, and all the stuff that the Boilerplate University wants us to have. So everything is on this page. To keep me from rambling too much, I decided to put together a PowerPoint that has what to expect this semester, as well as a course introduction. So in terms of procedure, this is not supposed to be just a lecture. This is supposed to be a conversation. So please do not think that you would be interrupting me or bothering me or otherwise um, feel like you shouldn't ask questions as soon as they come up. So one of the benefits of the Zoom environment, of course, is that you can use the chat window to type your questions in, and I, will, I have it open right now, and I'm used to keeping an eye on it. And you can use the direct messaging feature if you want to ask a question and not necessarily announce to everyone that it was you who asked it. And of course, you can always just raise your hand and unmute yourself and talk. That is, you know, perfectly fine too, and in fact, encouraged. Uh, in terms of cameras and microphones, you don't have to have your camera on if you don't want to or if you don't have the bandwidth to do so, but I really like seeing everybody's faces. So thank you for those of you who are able to do so and willing. So any questions before we jump into stuff? Shaking heads? Nope. All right. Then away we go. No, this thing's going to bother me. I got to remember how to move this thing away. Hide. That's what it is. Yeah. See, I remember. I can work a mouse and everything. All right. There we go. Intro to the class. Take one. So what to expect this semester? All of you are here because you want to be. This is not a required course. So either you're here because you want to be or someone else told you that you want to be here. One of the two. What we are going to do is not necessarily just learn statistics. I really don't like that word. I don't think of myself as a statistician. I think of myself as a quantitative methodologist. 
And what I hope to be able to do for you is to provide you with a different way of looking at the world that in turn can benefit the research that you came here to do, even if quantitative methods is not your primary area. Because I believe that models are the way that we look at research. So take, for example, analysis of variance, right? ANOVA, one of the first things that you're taught in statistics classes. ANOVA is all about testing differences between groups in terms of their means. If that's the only thing that you ever learned, then every research question that you would think of would have to do with some kind of group mean difference because that's the way that you know how to think about data. If you learn new models, that in, turns, that in turn is a different way of viewing the world and that can lead to new research questions which can lead to new answers. So I view this as an opportunity to strengthen the type of research and endeavors that you're here to do. So for those of you who haven't had me before, this is this, a few slides that are meant to reassure you. We're not gonna calculate stuff by hand. And in fact, all of the models that we're gonna cover in this class, you literally cannot, even if you wanted to. We're not gonna do proofs. We're not gonna do derivations. If you wanna learn how to do those things, go to the stats department or the biostats department and they will hook you up. What I am here to do is to teach you how to do data analysis. That is our focus. We have a very much implied focus. So it's okay to let the programs do the work and the heavy lifting. The hardest part about learning anything new in terms of quantitative methods, I believe is not the math because the computers are gonna do the math for you. The hardest part is language, logic, and the working memory load that it takes to hang on to all of it simultaneously. So by language, I mean not just the words that go with the ideas, but the notation, the symbols, the equations, the way of expressing that language in a formal representation, as well as how to translate that formal representation into software code that then does the math for you. So that's all language, that's not really math. Logic is the other part of it, especially in this class. It's very much if this, then that, in terms of how to work with different types of data. And so getting familiar with the logic, what things are sort of absolute versus what things are, well, it might go this way and it might go that way. Those kinds of nuances is what makes this material challenging. My own personal philosophy is that everyone can do this. I. Uh, Whenever I talk to people outside the university, like when I used to go places, remember that? When we used to just go places and not even think about where we were going or who we might run into or whether we had a mask on or what kind of mask we had on. Back in, back in those days, people used to ask me, what do you do for a living? And I always dread that question because it was like, I teach statistics. And the responses were usually one of two things. It's either, oh, I hated statistics. I had to take that too. Oh, I can't believe you picked that as your job. Or something like more polite. Oh, well, does that mean like it's a, like you teach the weed out courses? No, no, damn it, no. Everyone can learn how to do this. I truly believe that. There is no weeding out to this process. Those of you who have had more exposure to this kind of material and more practice with it will pick it up more quickly. And those of you who've had less exposure, it may take a little longer, but that's fine. Everybody learns at their own pace and everybody can learn to do this. Um, one of the ways that I'm going to help you do this is to encourage mastery learning. I'll talk about that more in just a second. In terms of the materials, um, the way that I've structured this class and basically all my classes into units where each unit is a combination of lecture slides and an example document. This one doesn't have an example with it since it's just a, uh, what do you call it, um, introductory deal. Um, I know that my slides have a lot of words. So this is a common sort of criticism on student feedback that my slides have too many words on them. Yes, yes they do. And for those of you who have been watching all the job talks that have been happening throughout our college and probably across campus, you would probably say that, yeah, the job talk slides do not look anything like my teaching slides. And indeed, when I give talks places, they look very different. The reason that I have such wordy slides is to save you from having to write or type everything. 
I want you to spend your time listening, absorbing, and thinking. And in fact, I have had students in previous semesters who spent their entire class period on the treadmill. I had a couple people who were getting their exercise in during class because they didn't have to write so much. So that's why the slides look like they do. Um, if that's a problem, I would recommend having like a Word document or just a piece of paper open that you can jot notes down and then you can figure out where to stuff them onto my very stuffed slides already. So the reason that I have two different types of documents is I think not just for my purposes, but also for yours, I use lecture slides to explain the what and the why. So every method that we can talk about can be described sort of conceptually first, like when do you do this, why do you do this? And then the actual execution via software to me is a separate process. So I started doing my teaching materials this way in response to workshops, actually. I've taught a lot of workshops and usually the workshops are like, can you talk about X method and can you do it in this software package? And so to be able to use my materials across different workshops, I developed separate examples and separate software packages. So I keep them separate um, and I think that they logically are separate too. In this class, and I know some of you are excited about this and some of you may be less so, we are going to be using SAS, Stata, or R. One of them, you gotta pick. Uh, by the way, do you want me to turn the transcript thingy on? Anybody like, does that, does that help anybody? The, tran the live transcript thingy? Eh? Yes, please. Yes, please, okay. I'm going to enable it. And very quickly, I am going to shut it off <laughs> so I don't have to watch myself talk. Um, it's very funny what it gets wrong. Hang on here. Hide a subtitle, by the way. If you click on your transcript button, you should have an option to hide it there. Now it's happening and it's gone. So SAS, Stata, or R. That's what I'm focusing on this semester. Your choice. We'll talk about those in a second. And all of these things are hosted outside of ICON on the antiquated course website that I just showed you. Uh, the reason that I do that is because uh, a year from now, if you want to come back and look up something, it's there. If it, everything were an icon, it would all be hidden from you. So it's on the World Wide Web for better or worse. It stays there and I keep my classes up forever. Um, the next time that I teach a class, I'll put the new version up once it's finished. So yes, uh, Farhan says hashtag fish sticks. Yes, fit statistics becomes fish sticks. My other, my other personal favorite was Remmel, which is an estimation method, becomes Rambo. What is it this time? Is it Rambo? Remmel? Remmo? Remmo this time? Okay, yeah. Yeah, fortunately the transcription on YouTube is much more accurate. So everybody is capable and everybody can benefit. So the benefits that are obvious to you, of course, getting better at your own research, learning new models to answer new questions, um, also more opportunities for authorship. If you become better at quantitative methods and better at quantitative methods in different programs, you have more collaboration opportunities. And last but not least, knowing how to do this kind of stuff can make you actual money as side hustles. I earned money as an undergraduate, as a graduate student, and as a postdoc by doing analyses for people. So this is actually very valuable content, in my humble opinion. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Please. So when it, um, when it comes to, like, once, once one becomes proficient enough to do d analysis of data, is that a pretty universal skill among any kind of topic or do people typically like specialize in certain areas? I would say that if someone says they can do everything, you should be very afraid. I think specialization is um, important. It's important to know when you're out of your depth, I guess. So I have had plenty of opportunities where people talk to me about what they want and I'm like, yeah, I'm not the person for that. You know, that, that's not in my wheelhouse. That's not something I feel comfortable advising on. Um, the thing about statisticians for hire is that there's no quality control, right? There's no like license exam that you have to pass. 
There's no way that you can differentiate really who knows their stuff from somebody who might know a little bit, but knows enough to be dangerous. So I would say that uh, one has to be careful both in thinking about your own limitations, but also in recognizing limitations of those that you might want to hire to do these sorts of things. So does that help answer your question? Okay. Um, other questions? Thoughts? Okay. Fair enough. So in this class, the things that you're going to be doing, uh, two types of activities. One is what I call formative assessments, otherwise known as quizzes, except that they are not graded for accuracy. The purpose of these activities, there'll be six of them, is to provide an opportunity for structured review. So each of these has three to four questions. They're big picture kinds of questions, things that should, that should be at the top of your head or very close to it. And if they're not, then that's your clue that you might need to go back and look at your notes again. So I look through your answers to these. They're all gonna be due on Monday evenings so that I can look through the answers the next morning and then I can see if there's any common misconceptions, common areas of confusion. We'll go over the answers together so you can see if what you wrote is sufficiently correct. It's not something that I provide a written answer key for usually. Um, it's more just an opportunity to form a structured review and discussion. The other type of thing that you'll be doing is homework. So there's no tests in this class, just homework. Uh, philosophically, I do not believe in tests for this type of material at this level. So what we do instead is homework. It, there are going to be about six of them. That's what I have planned, at least. And you will be doing it in the same online system that I use for all of my classes. So if you've done that before, then you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, um, I will allow access to that later this week. I am waiting to see if there's anybody who adds or drops late and I have a video already made to demonstrate what that looks like. So that I will elaborate on in just a second. So everything that you're gonna do in this class is take home, open note, and untimed. I don't care how long it takes you, but you, in terms of working on things. With the slight caveat that I want to save you from yourselves. So I know that things with hard due dates get done and things with soft due dates get pushed. So in order to encourage everyone to keep up with the material, I have a slight penalty for late work. If you don't do your formative assessment on time, it's half a point off of the two that you would earn. If you don't get your homework done on time, it's one point off out of however many points the homework is worth, usually somewhere between like 12 and 18, depending on how long the homework is. However, I also recognize that all of you are people who have other responsibilities, other classes, and a life to lead. So if you're looking at the calendar and you're thinking, oh, there's a homework due that week, but that's the week I'm supposed to be at a conference, or that's the week that I'm supposed to be in my sister's wedding, or that's the week that dot, 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 let me know. Please send me an email with the conflict and propose a new due date, and I'll probably most very much likely say yes. So if you're planful about it, two weeks in advance but you can always turn in work late. One thing that will help you though, is that the very first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to complete a practice homework labeled homework zero for two extra credit points. That's to test the system to make sure that you all know how to use it. And so that's basically like two free late homeworks for the semester. Uh, in terms of the due dates, the ones that I have on the schedule now are presupposing that we cover all of the material that I have planned in the interval in which I have planned it. If things take longer than I have planned, I will push the due dates back of the homework accordingly so that you have at least one week after we finish something before it would be due. So the due dates may adjust it to be later. They will never be adjusted to be earlier. I won't do that to you. Okay? Fair? Slight nods. Am I talking too fast? No, we're okay. All right, has everybody had lunch today? Not yet. Okay, I was gonna say, I will not be offended if you're eating your lunch while we're in class. Much like being on the treadmill, multitasking, if you can do it, is a good thing. To that, 
Cheers. All right. So formative assessments, I said that homework, uh, the homework assignments are going to be practice doing data analysis. The way it works is that all of you will have a common story and a common set of variables, but you'll have your own data set. So the homework system uses each of your ID numbers as a random seed to generate a new sample of data. So it's all the same, but a little bit different. So I will ask you to do the kinds of analyses that we'll be going over in class. Very similar in structure. So everything that you would have to do for a homework will be based on an example that I've already given you, meaning there will be no Googling required. You do not have to figure out the syntax on your own. I will show you an example that you can use directly and modify for our purposes. The two kinds of questions that are on there, one, are a, one type of question is computational. So I'll ask you a question like, what's the residual variance of the model? What is the estimate for the slope of this predictor? Where the right answer is a number. And you'll enter the number in the box. If you're right, the number turns green. If you're wrong, the box turns red. And you can try as many times as it takes to get the right number. Once you get the right number, you'll know that you're on the right track. So you can get instant feedback with infinite attempts on those types of questions. Once you know that you have all the right numbers, then comes the hard part, interpretation. So the second half of the assignment is what I call a results section or questions about what do the numbers mean. And those are all going to be multiple choice questions. So it's a paragraph essentially that you'll complete pieces of the text for with the right interpretation. And because they're multiple choice, you don't get instant feedback on them. However, once you submit your homework, then you'll get to see whether your answers were correct, and if not, what the correct answer should have been. And critically, in terms of these interpretations, they are going to be tied to the specific numbers that you got for your data. So for instance, you might have to decide if a given slope estimate for a predictor is significantly positive, non-significantly positive, significantly negative, or non-significantly negative. That might be one set of choices. And it's based on what you found with your data. So there's no feedback during the process. The feedback comes at the end, but throughout the semester, there'll be a lot of the same kinds of questions. And so you will get a chance for repetition and practice that way. So any thoughts or questions on course requirements? What I'm going to be asking you to do? No, we're good? All right. So my job, besides providing all of the lecture materials and actually doing the lecturing, is to answer questions. So that's the most important thing is because so much of the, this material builds on itself. If you lose the thread really early, it's very easy to get confused by everything that follows. So if you find yourself losing the thread and you want me to repeat something or define a word that you're not sure if you know what it means, please ask. It's best to ask during class. That way everyone can hear your answer, but even an email or separately is better than not asking at all. And I know that a lot of times it can feel awkward amongst your peers to really put yourself out there and admit that you don't know something. And so to that, I say two things. Number one, from my perspective, watching the people in the room or watching all of your faces, do you know what happens when someone asks a question? Either somebody has a look like, Oh, thank God, I was wondering about that. And you see them typing or writing as I answer. Or you see someone smile very bro broadly because they knew the answer and they're proud of themselves. And you just gave them a boost of confidence. So it's a good thing to ask questions. It won't make you look stupid. There is no such thing as a stupid question. If you don't believe me, then number two, use the direct messaging feature in Zoom. So even if you are sitting in person, you can log into Zoom from the computer that's going to be in our classroom or your own computer just for the sake of asking me questions privately. I had found that in this environment, I actually get more questions than normal because people have that option to do so. 
So that is another way that you can communicate without necessarily having to put yourself out there. So in terms of order of importance of getting through this class and doing well, asking questions when you get confused, frequently reviewing the material, and then not being afraid to ask for help. So particularly when it comes to doing your homework, it is very easy to let a very silly mistake get you off track. So this is the kind of thing that I can help with. If you send me a screenshot of your code and say, it's not working, what's wrong? I can look at it and be like, oh yeah, you're missing a semicolon on line 45, right? And you, then you can be back in business. So don't be afraid to ask for help because if there's a mistake to be made, I've probably made it before and that's how I can troubleshoot it so quickly. The book uh, question, let's see, is my analysis code SAS code? It will be SAS, STATA, and R this semester. I'm doing everything three ways. So I'll have more on that in just a second. So if you don't know SAS and you don't want to know SAS, I am cool with that. I'm just going to ask you to pick something, something to build on. Uh, the textbook. The textbook that I picked, I'm recommending it, it is not required, is a STATA book. But the reason that I picked it is because I haven't found anything that is as readable and comprehensive. So there's a lot of text in there and there's a lot of content in there that has nothing to do with STATA. They just happen to use STATA to show their examples. So it's not that expensive. Um, it may be available elsewhere if you have access to it. I don't think our library does, but you may be able to track it down elsewhere. So um, that will help facilitate uh, the material that we're going to go over. And then if you're still looking for things to help you practice doing this on data that you care about, that's the most important thing that you can do to actually translate this material from a classroom prescribed setting to the world that you care about. And if at any point as I'm talking, something comes to you and you want to say like, is is what you're talking about related to this thing that I'm working on? Those are my favorite kinds of questions. So don't be afraid to, to volunteer examples that we can talk through because having a context often helps. All right, attendance. You don't have to be here and I'm not going to take attendance. I'm operating under the assumption that all of you want to be here and that you will come if you're able to. And so I'm not going to keep track of attendance. If you need to miss class for whatever reason, you don't need to email me. Now, that being said, if you ghost me, right, if three weeks go by and I haven't seen you or heard from you and you haven't done anything, then maybe we need to talk. But I don't need to keep track of things. Um, if there's anything happening to you that will take you out of class for an extended period of time, please let me know. That's just uh, that way I cannot worry about you. Um, the university strongly encourages the use of masks in the classroom, and so do I. And please do not come if there is a chance that you are sick. Please. I can't say that any more strongly legally, but please, for the love of God, if you are sick, please don't come. How's that? <laughs> that is that a strong recommendation? Yeah, I, uh, I have a six-year-old. He is going to give me all the COVID exposure that I can handle because he's going to school for better or worse. He is masked at school, but still. So that's why we're in person today is because I did not want to expose you. I uh, Fortunately, our family did not get sick from this exposure, but I feel like it's just a matter of time. So don't worry about missing anything because you won't. I am going to record every class and I'm going to post the recordings on YouTube. So on the course website, back here, each day after I finish for the day, in the square that goes with that date, I will have a link to the video and what we covered. So there will be a playlist on my YouTube channel. You can get their lectures and day specific from here. You won't miss anything. The reason that I put it on YouTube, again, is so that you can come back to it later on. It doesn't have to be trapped behind icon and because YouTube's uh, algorithms actually do a pretty good job of transcription. So I don't know if you know this, but you can search through their videos for content. You can open up the transcript 
So there's a little um, menu looking icon that's to the right bottom of every video and when there's choices and if there's a transcript available you can open it and you can search through it. So if you know that I talked about something that you're looking for at some point that day, you can search through the video and find exactly where it was. So I find it to be a very useful supplement. All right, ask questions, we covered that. Um, changes. So there's a very charming American expression called shit happens. Is that an expression in other countries too? Is there a translation anyone wants to share? Non-English translation? Yeah, I swear a lot. Just, it happens. I try not to, but it, it comes out. So shit happens. If I'm exposed to COVID at the last minute, I will hit the eject button and coming to class. You guys can go to the room though. You can still be in person if you want to, and you can zoom from the classroom even if I'm not there. Um, if we get another giant snowstorm, check your email. I may eject into Zoom just to try and keep people safe. Um, particularly if public schools here are closed, I feel like that's a good barometer of when it's too dangerous to be on the roads or to be outside in the cold waiting for the bus. So I will not hesitate to hit the eject button if I need to to keep us all healthy and safe. And by eject, I mean go to Zoom, not cancel class. It is possible to do a synchronous class, I believe, that is just as good in this medium. All right. I'm talking a lot. I'm going to pause for a sip of water. Yeah, I'm double-fisted to get through the afternoon here. Any questions or comments from you? No, are we excited yet? Yeah, there's only one correct answer to that question. Right. We have a comment. Uh, how about people like me who are beginners with the softwares? Any flexibility to getting us soft started? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So I am teaching the course after this one, which is Intermediate Statistical Methods. Uh, many of you have probably just finished that course or finished it within the last year or so. And that course is designed for people who have never used software. So one of the things that I'm working on is recording videos that, is, that demonstrate, like if you've never seen SAS before, like how to open it and navigate through it. And if you've never seen Stata before, and if you've never seen R before. So I, am, I have a, a handout that I just finished with screenshots and I'm going to have videos. They're not done yet, but they will be coming up soon for how to get started with all of that stuff. So I'm not necessarily assuming that you have used any of these three programs. I'm assuming that you're familiar with the prerequisite material and that you've used a program before. The idea of just working with software. But all of my examples then are going to give you, I think, sufficient structuring to be able to take them and port them over to be able to do your homework. So yes, I'm not expecting you to be an expert in any of these three programs. No worries. Um, if we have experience with R, how mutually intelligible is Stata with that? Not. Not, okay. <laughs> it's, it, it's different. I, I, ha I have a few slides on that, actually, because I figured that I would have these questions. They're all kind of their own thing. So yes, thank you. Did you know this was coming is the next slide? I, I could not have put together a better segue if I had tried. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I love it. So yes, I actually looked this up. I wasn't even sure what SAS and status stood for, and so I looked this up, and these are the official answers I got from the Google. Uh, statistical analysis system in Stata. So um, Stata is spelled everywhere else in the world like this, capital S with the rest being lowercase. I always do it capital for two reasons. Uh, number one, it matches the other programs, and number two, it irritates me that they won't let me have capital letters in Stata for their commands. So just to be ornery, I capitalize it. So that's just me trying to fight the man, right? Don't tell me I can't use capital letters. Watch. I just did. So it's Stata. And R, of course, is a program and a letter. And R is actually a free implementation of what used to be an S programming language. So I saw S for like this much back in grad school. I don't remember very much about it. 
So the first question then that people usually ask me is, well, but I learned SPSS, why can't I use that? Ugh. You can use it for some things, but it does not have all of the models that we need in this class, and it does not have as many options for advanced models as the other programs. The way that I like to describe this is, like, if you just moved into your apartment and you want to hang up a poster, right, you need a hammer. You want to go buy a hammer? You can go to Target. You can go to Walmart. You might even be able to go to Hy-Vee and find a hammer, right? Like the, like the aisle that has home improvement stuff. I think of that as SPSS. You need to find out what a variable's mean is. You want a set of correlations? SPSS is fine. You'll get your hammer that way. But if you are putting together a piece of furniture and you lose like a screw that has like a little star in it, you know, it's like a specialty screw and, and, and you want to go and get a replacement for it, you need to go to like Lowe's or Home Depot or Ace Hardware or someplace that's like a dedicated store. So I think of SPSS as like the hardware aisle at Walmart versus Home Depot is the, uh, the other programs. There's just more there. So that's why I don't emphasize SPSS and it's already enough work to do everything three times in three different programs that I'm unwilling to pick up a fourth. So my personal story, I grew up with SPSS and I'm so old that they didn't even have windows when I started using SPSS. I typed syntax first and then SPSS came out with the Windows drop-down menus that made it so popular. I had to learn SAS in order to do multi-level models when I started learning that in graduate school. And I picked up enough SAS to fall in love with the program. I love SAS, I'm not gonna hide it. I'm a SAS enthusiast. Then people were like, can you teach this workshop, but can you do it in Stata? Well, I can try. And so I picked up enough Stata to be able to do that. And then over the years, I added Stata to my classes because there was a demand for it. And I am begrudgingly learning R. So I am an R newbie. To be honest, I hate it. I, I really do not like the language that has not changed. And those of you who've heard me before know this, it has not changed. I've gotten better at it, but I still hate it. So I am a novice when it comes to R, especially and to some extent with Stata. So if you see me do something in R and you're like, yeah, I know how to do that in way less code, please tell me. You will not offend me whatsoever because I admit that I am out of my depth when it comes to most things with R. Fortunately, I live with an R expert who keeps assuring me that if I just keep trying, I'll eventually fall in love with R. So we're going to respectfully disagree on that conclusion, but I do have access to help. That's not just the Google, thank goodness. So please help me if you can with these programs. So the programs themselves, you do not need to do anything in terms of purchasing anything. You can use them through the virtual desktop. All three of those programs, SAS, Stata, and R are available in there. In terms of which one to focus on, so folks have asked me this, I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is the lay of the land with respect to pros and cons. So for those of you who are quant students, like your PhD, your master's quant students, or you're picking up a master's in something quant to add to your collection, learn them all, seriously, because you should be building a section of your CV that's called something like technical skills or methodological skills and the more programs you can list on there, the better. So being able to learn multiple programs will benefit you down the road, even if you're not necessarily going to be at the same level of proficiency in all of them. In terms of what to focus on when choosing which one you should pledge allegiance to this semester. So the big reason that people use R is because it's free. You can download R onto your own computer regardless of whether it's a Mac or a Windows or Linux or whatever, and you can use it. That is like the predominant reason why people pledge allegiance to R besides the open source thing. SAS also has a web-based uh, interface. They're trying to recapture their market share. If you are affiliated with the university, you can get free access to it. I haven't played with it as much, but it does seem to have all of the same capabilities as SAS inside the virtual machine or an installation. Whereas to the best of my knowledge, there is no free version of Stata in the world. 
So in terms of thinking about where you may end up with your job after this and what software you may or may not have access to, if you're concerned about not having access to paid software, perhaps you pick R or SAS for that reason over Stata. However, can I get a show of hands for my EPLS representatives? No, no one's listening. EPLS people in the house. They had to say, Nikki, I'm talking to you, Solomon. Yeah, okay. So your fields often use Stata because Stata has capabilities that are very slick for working with large survey data and particularly survey weights. So if that's something that you know you're going to have to do down the road, then Stata might be where you put your emphasis. Um, the fields that I have come across in teaching workshops, sociology, political science, public health, those are the areas that tend to use Stata more than other programs. So that's a consideration. And last but not least, what you would need to take further coursework. So any of the upper level courses with me, I am now going to do SAS, Stata, and R for all of them to the best of my ability. But if you take courses from other people, so Ariel Aloe, Brandon LeBeau, or Jonathan Templin, they only do R. So this is your chance to learn R if you know that you're going to be taking courses with them. And R has become increasingly popular in mainstream. Most of the job ads that I've seen come across my desk list R explicitly as something that they want you to know. However, I think it's important with all of the R enthusiasm to note a few of its limitations. The packages that you have in R are only as good as its programmers. And that means not just being able to understand the models well enough to program all of that stuff, but, but being able to understand numerical precision and issues with that. So if you have somebody who invents a new thing and they make an R package, you have to trust that they really know what they're doing because there's very little quality control. As an example of this, um, Jonathan once taught a workshop on diagnostic models and he used a new R package to do those. And when he was running analyses in the class, one of his results was a probability of 1.2. Wait for it. Yeah. Probability of 1.2. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's not a thing. That's not possible. So, and of course he got to make a joke. Yeah, Lisa's right. Yeah, this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so especially with the newest stuff, you have to be careful of what you're looking at. And one of the things that I found frustrating about R is that there's a million ways to do different things and they all are slightly different from each other in a way that's like, oh my God, why doesn't it work? And it's like, oh, because in this package, it's not formula, it's model. You know, little things like that, that can hamper you. So that's my source of frustration with it. So it can be more challenging to work with than the other packages that have documentation that's very much regularized. So here's a table that I made with my thoughts on SAS versus Stata. I don't have a lot of thoughts on R yet as I'm still trying to get uh, acquainted with those. So uh, comments or questions about syntax programs? And you don't have time to decide, too. This is just, I'm just asking you to learn one of them. So we had a uh, question about what it looks like to do syntax in different programs. So one of the things to keep in mind is specificity of typing. So Stata and R are both case sensitive with respect to their syntax. So you have to be very specific about how you type things to make sure that you haven't screwed something up. And Stata, everything is in lowercase, which frustrates me. Uh, that's because when I make examples, one of the things that I like to do when possible is to use capital letters for dedicated commands and lowercase or title case for options that you would change like names of variables and stuff. And I can't do that in R and Stata. So Stata, or SAS, excuse me, is very regularized. You manipulate data inside something that's called a data step and it always looks the same. And all of the analyses that you would do have the same structure. It's proc something with the options and then run to close it. So you can anticipate what something would look like even if you've never used the proc before because all procs look the same. 
Uh, semicolons are a line terminator. So that's how you tell SAS that you're done with a given command. So if semicolons being missing is a common source of errors in SAS, that's something I can help you troubleshoot. Stata syntax is also very regularized. Everything in Stata is structured in the same way, but with way fewer words. So this is good if you don't like typing, but it's bad from a pedagogical perspective because it leaves a lot behind the scenes. It's very much less transparent. And Stata uses the end of the line as the line terminator. So if you want to have a command that wraps across multiple lines, you have to have this slash 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 term as a line continuer. And R syntax, if you've never learned a coding language before, looks bizarre. If you have learned a coding language, it will look familiar because it's just a bunch of functions. Everything in R is a call to a function, which means something in parentheses where you list the arguments to the function that, the, that it uses. And one of the things that I will highly recommend is to use RStudio. So R and RStudio are both free. RStudio makes R way easier to use on the surface. All right. So I have an example of what the syntax would look like. I wanted to have a little fun with this. We'll see if it works. So let's say that someone asked you how your dinner was. You know, back when we used to be able to go to dinner and like anywhere and not worry about it as opposed to just always doing takeout. So put yourself back in those days and someone asks you, how, how was your dinner today? And you say, it was fine. It wasn't too spicy. So to me, that would be good, right? I can't do spice of any kind. It kills me. It causes me physical pain to have anything that's spicy. So to me, not spicy means good dinner. So below, I have an example of what that response would look like in each program. So in SAS, it would look something like this. I made this up. Proc answer. What am I answering about? My dinner. So in SAS, all of your commands, you have to tell it what data set you want to do it to. Because in SAS, you can have multiple data sets open at a time. So I'm answering about dinner. What's my answer? Response equals fine. Spicy equals no. So after you specify what you want to go into your analysis, options for that analysis happen after a slash. And then this thing, run with a semicolon, that makes it go. If you forget the run, it'll just sit there. Like, and the analogy that I use to that, the run is like saying please. So do any of you have children? Can I get a show of hands? Nobody here? So maybe someday you will have children and you'll find yourself in the following situation. Mommy, 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 can I have some water? I sit there. Mommy. Can I have some water? Oh, I didn't hear you. And then he knows the answer is, okay, mommy, can I have some water, please? Oh, now I heard you. Okay, yes, you can have some water, sweetheart. Run is like saying please at the end. You have to add it or it's not going to go. Uh, it's the same as execute in SPSS, by the way. The same setup in Stata would look like this. What you're doing is the first word answering. The information about your answer comes next, comma, and then the, spice, the options. That's it. So there's no reference to a data set because in Stata, there's only one data set open at a time. And they changed that in recent versions with something called frames. But if you look anywhere on the internet for Stata code, it will look like this. So the data set that it refers to is the one that is open. And you don't have to say please, you don't have to say run. Once you execute the code, the results just pop out. That's it. So there's a lot less typing comparatively. And then R would look something like this. So you would save what you want to do as an object. And here's the function, for example. And of course, whoever made this function would get cute and make the answer, the R, be capital, because they do that kind of thing. You refer to what data set it is. Here's your model. And then here's some options. And then if you just run this first line, it'll sit there staring at you. If you actually want to know what happened, you have to add a second command that is summary for it. So you don't necessarily have to do it this way with the save the thing and then print the thing. 
but a lot of the examples that you'll see are structured that way, which is why I have it here. So I forget who it was that asked me about the syntax, but does that answer your question about how these things look like each other or don't? A little bit, yeah. They're different, they're different animals. So um, each has its pros and cons. So uh, getting started, here is a link to the other class that I teach after this that's going to have uh, introductory videos and more introductory materials on how to get started with these programs. Uh, I once had someone ask me, are we expected to memorize all of these codes? No, absolutely not. You do not need to memorize any of this stuff. You're going to do what I do. You're going to find an example of what you need to do. You're going to copy it. You're going to paste it into a new file and you're going to mess with it. That's what you're going to do. And that is literally what I do whenever I need to do something in any package. I find somewhere where I've done something like that before, I port it over and then I change it. Find and replace is going to be your new best friend. So control H in Windows. Is it command H in Mac? Can anyone confirm? Is that any Mac users in the house? No Mac users? Come on, that's unlikely. No one wants to talk to me. Don't, I, I haven't scared you away already, have I? That's gotta be a new Not record. At all. Hmm? Not at all. Not at all, okay, good. So find and replace. So for instance, like if I give you a whole set of codes that work with example one as a data set, click find and replace, change the name of the data set everywhere. So find and replace is gonna be your new best friend. The colors help you troubleshoot. All of the programs use different color conventions for their syntax, SAS more than the others. Um, in SAS, if your syntax ever turns red, something is wrong. It should never be red. Red is bad. Ask me for help and I promise it does get easier. All right, what I want you to know already to be here the formal recommended prerequisite is our department's intermediate statistical methods course, which has undergone a revision this year relative to what it used to be to address general linear models specifically. These are the concepts though, that I want you to be familiar with in order to be equipped to come to this class. I don't care in what class you took it. And to be honest, there is literally no way that I can enforce prerequisites anyway. Did you know that? At the graduate level, there's no filter. You all can enroll in whatever classes you want and there's no way to check the prerequisites unless you do it manually. At the undergraduate level, they can force people out of the class for prerequisites. But what I want you to be able to do predominantly, basic stuff, descriptives, correlations, things like that, uh, concepts, so how to do a hypothesis test, what the idea of significance means, what's the idea of power means, that kind of stuff, and then general linear models, and especially with moderation. So this semester, you are going to get a lot of practice on linear models, and especially linear models with interaction terms. That's gonna be the first thing that we practice starting next week. We're gonna do a review of general linear models with interactions, because you may not have had these in the way that I need you to understand them in order to move forward. So I wanna make sure that we're all kind of on the same page in terms of the language, and the strategies with which we would approach interpreting interaction terms, because that tends to be the topic that's the most hit or miss across different types of classes I've found. All right, so do you have any questions about software or things that you should know already to be comfortable joining this class? No? I didn't see anybody leave, so I think that's a good sign, right? Didn't hear the, the door slam. So what are we going to do then after reviewing some of this stuff? Generalized linear models. What the heck is that? So the term general linear model, the word general in it actually means something very specific. Gen general, as it is used in general linear models, means models that have a conditionally normal residual, meaning normal after you put all your predictors in. That's what general means. If you swap out the word general with generalized, 
then those are regression type models for not normal outcomes. All kinds. So we're going to go through a whole list of those. Generalized models for our first. First type of model is going to be binary outcomes. Then categorical, which is ordinal and nominal. Then unit three is counts and what I call if and how much outcomes. So those go by the names of zero inflated models or hurdle models. It's when you have a pile of zeros and then a distribution of some kind because you have a mixture of populations that you're in, uh, examining. Uh, we have a sort of catch-all of other not normal, so binomial outcomes, skewed continuous outcomes, and then I use that unit to talk about quantile regression which is something that is useful if you have outliers, but otherwise your data might be somewhat continuous and normal-ish. After that section, we're going to switch gears and talk about multivariate models. So multivariate meaning more than one outcome at the same time. That's a word that often gets misused. Multivariate means multiple outcomes, not just multiple variables. So when would you need a multivariate model? A couple examples of that, um, dyadic data. So have you heard of actor partner models before? No? Okay, well that is when you have a person and a partner to the person and they're both answering the same questions. A uh, question from the audience, Nathan? Yeah, I wanted, to, so when you say that the residuals are normal, do you mean that the uh, residuals are normally distribu distributed? for the general linear models? Yep. Okay. And I make the point that it's not the outcome that has to be normal, it's the residuals. So what is left over is supposed to be normal. Yep, that's what general means. So iased is not normal, broadly construed. If it's not normal, what else could it be? So we'll have a, a tour of those here coming up uh, on okay. Thursday. I, one more um, yeah. quick, so like um, you would use generali generalized linear models in all the cases where if you mapped out the residuals, they were not behaving in a normal distribution. Is that like the first qualifier? Yes, but it's more about why are they not normal because okay. how were they measured in the first place? Okay. Right, right? so like if you have a binary outcome, um, you know, dead or alive, you know, pregnant or not, right? There's no such thing as a little bit pregnant, right? You're either pregnant or not. Although people in their third time trimesters may feel very pregnant as opposed to not that pregnant. It's really more of a binary thing. So if I have a model where I'm predicting the presence of something versus the absence, there is no universe in which those residuals are normal. Like mathematically, it cannot happen. So rather than like trying to transform the data or beat the data into something that looks like normal, the question is, well, how is the variable measured in the first place? And is there a distribution that's just a fundamentally better match? And it turns out that, yeah, normal is just one of a whole laundry list of possibilities. And normal gets taught first because it's the easiest mathematically. It, there's closed form, like you can do shit by hand with normal distributions that you can't do with others. But if you have a, bin a, a binary outcome, then you need a Bernoulli distribution instead. Likewise, if you have an ordinal outcome, you need a multinomial distribution instead. So it's more about like thinking about how was the outcome measured in the first place, and then how do I match a distribution that just makes sense? Yes, graduated or not. That's a good one, Nikki. Yeah, has anyone told you about the two kinds of dissertations that there are? There's only two kinds. The two kinds of dissertations in the world are done or not done. That's it. Those are the only distinctions that matter. You get the done kind, you graduate. The not done kind, you don't graduate. Doesn't have to be good, doesn't have to be great, needs to be done. What you do with your product of your research after that is up to you. But yes, done and not done is a very good example of a binary variable. All right, so multivariate, that's where I was, unless there's other questions about general versus iced. No, okay. So multivariate, there's a lot of research designs that lend themselves to multivariate models. Actor partner is one. Um, any kind of family data where you survey like like the a kid and their parent, that's another kind of dyadic data. Uh, different scores. 
So there are several outcomes where the difference between two things is what you're interested in. Those are best analyzed with multivariate models, as well as just repeated measures. So experimental designs where you have a within subjects manipulation where everybody does every condition, those require multivariate models. And you would have learned that as like repeated measures ANOVA. That's one of the things we'll talk about is that as a specific case of a multivariate model that makes certain assumptions that are actually testable relative to what the other choices are available to you. Most of this unit five here is going to be using normal conditional outcomes for good reason, because if you're using it within the same types of univariate software, it actually doesn't work very well. And then what we're gonna wind up with at the end is path analysis. So path analysis is often taught in the same class as structural equation modeling. I don't do that. Because to me, path analysis is regression, just a bunch of them at once, because it's using observed variables only. So I wanna teach you how to do path analysis because it's honestly not that much harder than just regular old regression, but it allows you to do a lot of cool things. Uh, one of the things that path analysis is most useful for is mediation models. So the idea that you have like X and X predicts or causes this mediator and this mediator in turn predicts Y. And once you control for that mediation, this path from X to Y is no longer important. That kind of idea is best uh, tackled with a multivariate model where you can fit all of those relationships simultaneously. Um, so we'll look at path analysis with outcomes that are conditionally normal as well as outcomes that are not and the options that are available to you then will differ by software package. So that's what we're doing this semester. That's the list. All right, that's a good place to pause. So let's see here, class is almost over. I made it through 15 whole slides. Woohoo. Farhan, question from the audience. Uh, yeah, are we, so we're gonna cover mediation models as yep. well, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's that's good because I, I still don't get the difference between mediation and moderation. Oh, well, that's a, that's a separate question, but I'm happy to tell you. Yeah. Okay. Moderation is an interaction term, and mediation is a reason why two things were related. Uh, got it. it is, okay. So if you have a question, like, let's see here. Uh, someone give me a relationship that I can work with here between a predictor and an outcome. Um, coffee and mood in the morning. All right. So people who drink more coffee are happier in the morning. Is that our working yeah, hypothesis? Yeah, definitely. For sure. That's, that's, I mean, N, N equals one. So N equals uh, one. I'm... Okay. Do we have a larger sample than that? Is anyone else happier when they have enough coffee in the morning? Okay, yeah, we got a few people, I'll put myself. Or maybe the right way to talk about it is less grumpy. <laughs> maybe not happier, but less unhappy. Either way, okay, so people who drink more coffee are, are happier than they in the morning. We'll go with that. Um, do you think that that depends on how old you are? Could be, makes, makes sense, yeah. So like if I'm 15, do I need more coffee than a 35-year-old? Probably not. Yeah, probably Generally, not. yeah. But it's, it's an empirical question, right? Yeah. Do you think there's gender differences or sex differences and how caffeine hits your bloodstream? Possibly. Or differences by weight, right? How much coffee you need to, to get that get up and go. All of those are questions of moderation. Yep. Does this effect hold to the same extent for different kinds of people? That's a moderation question. Yeah, that's like an interaction term. That's an interaction term. Mediation is, no, this is the reason. So a mediation example would be something like coffee leads to, let's go with decreased cortisol. And the decreased cortisol is what makes you happier. I'm just making shit oh. up, right? This, this sounds yeah, yeah, plausible, okay. right? I'm, I used mm. to be a psychologist. I'm allowed to take such liberties. So... Then in that thing, it would be like, is there still a relationship between coffee as the X and mood as the Y after I control for coffee's effect on cortisol or amylase or any other hormone? Okay, so sort of like an ANCOVA? Yep. 
it, here's the thing. Mediation is regression with a much better marketing campaign behind it. Okay. It is. Because what that question boils down to is a unique effect. So if I build a regression model of coffee predicting mood, is coffee still a significant predictor after I control for cortisol? Doesn't that sound like a regression question? That's yeah, mediation. Yeah, sounds like ANCOVA. Yeah, that, that's ANCOVA works too. We have a comment. Moderation influences the strength of the relationship between two things, whereas mediation explains the relationship. Bingo. Okay. Yep, that's the difference. And you're not alone in questioning whether these words are synonyms or not. I've read plenty of research hypotheses that suggest people don't understand. So for instance, I've heard um, people want to examine things like age as a mediator between the relationship of, say, physical decline and cognitive decline, and they want to know if age mediates that relationship. Now let's think about it. In order for that to make sense, it would have to be physical decline makes you older and being older makes you have cognitive decline. The only thing that makes you older is the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> Age cannot be a mediator. So things that exist outside of this system, they can only be moderators. They cannot be mediators. Yeah, sounds like you need to have a cause and effect relationship there. Yes, and so that's that's where mediation got its its start in the experimental design literature, where something it was like X is causally is causally like created, right? Random assignment and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The way that it's used in practice is often in an observational data set where everything is manip is measured at the same time. Nothing's manipulated. And then, then you really have to argue if you want to claim mediation in the, the causal sense. It's a much bigger stretch. So, but yes, we're going to, we're going to learn how to do both mediation All and right. moderation and path analysis allows you to do both in the same model. Got it. Yeah. That clears it up. Uh, so there's still some things, but we'll get to that uh, in class, I guess, but thanks. Yep. So this is just the big picture and I want to, in the next half of this that we'll do on Thursday, uh, describe sort of my worldview of how all this stuff fits together and how learning these two things, this idea of, um, and I said, oh, we haven't talked about the other thing yet. Generalized models is one of the key things that's going to allow you to learn other models down the road. So that's the foreshadowing for Thursday. But it's 1.42 by my clock. That means it's time to eject. So... Any questions or other comments before we say goodbye? I ha it, it probably won't take three minutes, but <laughs> um, if you have data and you want to, you know, do maybe set up a regression analysis, and the data is based on like a Likert scale, is it better to go the generalized route versus the general route? If the if the the Likert item is an outcome, yes. Okay. If it's a predictor, then it's an empirical question whether that predictor has a linear relationship despite its ordinal status, or whether it's okay. better described with a series of like piecewise differences between categories, multiple slopes. Because I've seen a lot of uh, interesting ways that people have set up survey data to say, oh my goodness, you know, like a an average of 5.3 or 4.3, but what is a 4.3 if you can only choose one number, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. We talked about that in Dr. Lebeau's class last semester. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, those aren't real numbers. That's the thing. I mean, it's, it's not real. So you, you, you have to suspend disbelief a little bit. I will show you the, the, the proper way of analyzing an ordinal variable like that. So, all right. Then, um, as far as I know, I'm hoping to be back in the classroom on Thursday provided Huey doesn't get sick today or something like that. I will send out an email confirming, but otherwise I hope to see you in person if you choose to come in person, and I hope to see you on Zoom if you choose to stay home. Cool? All right, see you Thursday, either way. Thanks for coming. Have a good day. Thank you, Lisa, bye. Bye-bye.